a perfect transition, Melon, uh, because I believe you are among uh, the two individuals I have to introduce next. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Milan Patel, who's the co-founder of RDF, and uh, you're the chief medical officer, and Cameron Andres, uh, who's the research assistant. So I'm going to turn it over to you both now, as sharply dressed men, uh, to take it away and talk a little bit more about the microgram program results. So take it away. Yeah, thank you, Marco. Um, really happy to be here and and to be sharing um, ten years of work with everybody. And um, just to uh, tell you a little bit about me, um, I'm uh, one of the co-founders, one of ten co-founders of Rare Disease Foundation, and I've been the chief medical officer for a couple of years now, and I was a research director before that. Um, so I want to introduce uh, the person who did a lot of the work, uh, and I mean a lot of work, to get these results wrangled for us, and that's Cameron. Um, Cameron Andres has a sister with a rare condition. His mother actually came up with the name Rare Finds for our gala way back in the day when she was a board member for many years with us. And uh, his mother and father are longtime supporters, uh, Monica and Dale, um, longtime supporters of RDF. So uh, Cameron, welcome and uh, tell us about what you do when you're not working uh, so hard for RDF. Yeah, definitely. Uh, no, I, I am a, a fourth year student at the moment at UBC and I'm doing a degree in physiology and immunology. So that's something that's really exciting to me. And I'm currently in the process of working through the medical school application process. So kind of following in the footsteps of all of the uh, all of the researchers and academics who are doing all the wonderful work here for RDF. And uh, I'm also heavily invested in in the arts as well. I've been a professional musician and actor for oh, probably 10 years now, and I, I really have a, a passion for my creative side as well. Cool. So um, you worked this summer and through the entire fall as well, even to this day on uh, the project. And so tell, tell me what uh, stuck out to you about this project. Sure. So the immediate thing that stuck out to me was just how many projects were funded over these past 10 years. It's it, it just truly incredible. I believe it's over 500 projects that were approved for funding. And that's 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 an incredible amount of research that's being done with with, with this, especially given the, the limited funding. And so the, these small grants have been also highly effective in translating into into publications and into presentations. And so not only were a lot of projects funded, but a lot of really successful projects were funded. And that was something that that immediately struck me was just the magnitude of uh, the weight of the results that were that were coming out of this program were, were really, really incredible. Awesome. Yeah, I, I feel exactly the same way. And uh, so from your perspective, any fun or interesting stories that you came across as you chased all these PhDs and MDs and MD PhDs down to uh, get these results from them? Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that's part of part of what makes RDF's microgram program and kind of looking through all the research so compelling is is reading through all these results and you can see the direct impact they're having on people. And so I've kind of in my in my uh, brain here categorized it into these four main sections of stories that really stuck out to me. And the first one and perhaps the most notable one is important therapies or or even cures that were developed with just these small grants that that are it's truly incredible i mean uh, supported by the microgrant program there was a group of researchers that discovered uh, that beta blockers, which is a, a pharmaceutical or an effective treatment for complex facial hemangiomas, which are these disfiguring tumors in infants that affect their ability to breathe, see and eat. It's really detrimental to their quality of life. And they essentially managed to cure this disease by by just getting this funding that they needed to test out this drug on a select population of patients using using this program and they they essentially cured the disease and these infants were able to move on and live happy healthy lives after this which is 
it's just incredible, quite frankly. I mean, uh, knowing what I know about, about the research environment and as somebody just entering that research environment, it, uh, it takes a lot more funding like that most of the time to get something this this important done. And so that was that was something that was truly incredible. And the next category uh, that I kind of looked at was diagnoses and how many of these micro grants went to directly funding diagnoses for patients that didn't know what their condition was that were being afflicted by 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 things that were very detrimental to them and but they were they managed to figure out what it was and that these these diagnoses not only open lanes for future therapies but also give better understanding into the disease and into how they might explore uh, diagnostic tests and and things in that regard um, and so it, that those results are also incredibly meaningful not just to a single person but then it, it really branches out to the whole community and so my next category that I uh, kind of want to look at is the uh, s the small grants that were used to be parlayed into these large, large grants that went on to have very meaningful results. So kind of how the microgrant program spawned these massive projects that just came out of these tiny grants. I mean, there, there was one, uh, a grant of three and a half thousand dollars that allowed uh, a group of researchers to have seed money to identify a rare group of metabolic diseases that caused intellectual disability. And these are causes that for which therapies are available and it allows them to characterize it and to and to kind of create a database as well. And this work led to a, a grant of over two million dollars from the BC Children's Hospital Foundation that funded a large research and care project for these patients. And so that's just that's just incredible. All of the, the you know, three and a half thousand dollars turned into two and a half million dollars nearly, which is really, I mean, it's amazing. And then the final category is the really exciting stuff that's that's kind of the emerging areas of research. And that is especially into gene therapies, CRISP, new CRISPR Cas9 therapies that are coming out. And so with microgrants, work has been done into Duchenne muscular dystrophy, into dysphrenopathies, and into a range of other rare conditions. And you know, working towards these gene therapies, it, it's the forefront of research. And so RDF is is involved in in that aspect as well. In in pushing the industry forward. Well, I love your enthusiasm and I've loved it all summer and all fall. So I'm glad it's still there. <laughs> a long, long blog of getting all these uh, 464 results back. Um, yeah, certainly. And, uh, is there anything uh, you'd like uh, somebody your age to know about this microgram program? I think that the most important things for, for people to realize, especially kind of in my position here where I'm just entering this world of research, where I'm just entering the world of academia and, and medicine. And I think what's really important for people to know is, uh, or one very important aspect of, of this program that's very important uh, for people to know is the lay summaries that are provided at the end, uh, at the end of the micro grants. And those are made in a way where the patients can read them, the public can read them, and they're presented in a way where everyone can access this information. And moving forward, I think that's something that's really important to science fundamentally, and especially medical research, is communication. And, and so uh, the fact that the microgrant program has, has spawned and, and allowed for such great communication is, I think, something that's really important for us all to keep in mind as we, as we kind of move into this. This, this new space. And another thing that I, that I think is incredibly important and, and for people to know is that the microgram program encourages this interdisciplinary information sharing patient focused research and care and research as care, which is really, really more important as we focus more and more on personalized medicine, moving into, into kind of the future of modern medicine. Uh, focusing that this patient centric care, but also with researchers from every discipline collaborating to to help these patients. Uh, that's something that's really important. And so this funding model, I mean, I truly believe that it, it addresses a number of, of the issues with the current funding models in place around the world. And I think that it's something that should be implemented everywhere because
it's shown not only really meaningful results, it's shown very tangible results. And it's shown that it, it encourages a culture of collaboration that, that's becoming more and more and more important. Thanks, Cameron. You're hired for our spokesman job. <laughs> uh, um, we're gonna we're gonna pivot here to um, the uh, our little presentation. Um, can everybody see Cameron? Can you see the screen? Yep. Great. So uh, I just want to start with uh, gratitude. Um, this is a partnered program with the BC Children's Hospital Foundation. And Mike Gotten, the boss, and Ellen Punjani have for 10 years done all of our financial back end through the BC Children's Hospital Foundation. So we're super grateful to them. Um, grateful to David Spear, who uh, Dr. Neil Burkle and I interviewed, and he came up with the idea of this, or he, he had this micro grant running in his department as a department chair. And he just, we were just discussing how to research going that's more you know, helping patients rather than building careers. And he said, well, I do this in my department, you know, one or two a year. And um, Neil really recognized how, how that could be a model that's useful for rare diseases. Because in the old days, we used to go down to pathology and say, hey, you, can you run a few stains for me? Or we'd go to the machine shop. De Michael DeBakey went to the machine shop in the hospital and made a heart valve. And that's how artificial heart valves came to be invented. But those things have all been closed and gone since the, the budget people have taken over healthcare. So we're trying to really bring that back. You know, how do we get a small amount of money that a great idea can pursue? And so the people that have really uh, powered that vision, uh, apart from the many um, staff and volunteers of the Rare Disease Foundation and board members, um, is Angela and Ted Longstaff, who've really funded us in a huge way. Um, and a large Quebec foundation that prefers to be anonymous also um, in a big way. And then uh, a couple of major funders, Abercrombie Foundation and Cascadia Metals. Um, I'd like to thank um, the 54 grant reviewers who review all our grants and they're always reviewed half by patients and parents and half by scientists and doctors. So we have both of those perspectives going into what gets funded. Um, and then our three, um, our three research coordinators, Marion Thomas, Kirsten Mueller, and Chloe Lim is our current one who really run this program for us. Um, what we've seen is that, um, well, these are three quotes from uh, uh, three young women who, who were young when, and at the beginning of their career when uh, we started the microgrant program. And they've gotten a lot of microgrants through the program because they see how powerful it is. And so Gabriella talks about how we were well ahead of our time um, in practicing precision medicine before that was even a term in medicine. And so that talks about um, the students that were inspired to become physicians because these things are, these little micro grants are great for students and fellows and residents to get. And it inspires them because they see, wow, I can bring the power of biotechnology to help my patients. And it's, it's really powerful. And those students went on to go into medical school and we have changed hearts and minds of a generation of new trainees with this program. And that's really what we wanna do with it. Um, and then Anna talks about how pivotal these microgrants uh, were in getting her career started. So uh, a few numbers for you. Uh, we had a thousand, almost a thousand applications and we, we awarded 565. So a little bit over the 50% success rate we were targeting um, because most grant competitions have like a nine or 10% success rate, which means you waste a lot of time applying and we didn't want that. We wanted busy, smart people to bring their best ideas to us and we wanted to fund them if they were good. Um, 464 of those went ahead. Some of them, the, the patients uh, decided not to, uh, they didn't want to go ahead with research for various reasons. Other times the fellow left or graduated and so they couldn't, couldn't do it because their, their person who was the tip of the spear was gone. Um, but uh, it's still 464 projects. So we awarded 2 million and those researchers at least the number that we know of, and it's going to be more than this, but the number we know of is 10.6 million. 
So we're multiplying money by at least fivefold in, in using this program. In terms of uh, what we uh, got back, um, our impact, uh, well, our numbers are based on feedback on 74.4% of the total. And so um, it's a pretty good sample size. We've got a lot of patients involved, at least 2,000 known, but I'm sure it's more like 10,000 if we uh, had all our, all our numbers in. Um, but at least 2,000 patients involved in this, which really speaks to how this is a partnership between physicians, scientists, and patients, and parents to make this happen. And so impacting 3% of children worldwide with $2 million in an era when it cost $2 billion to make a drug or one cure um, is phenomenal and stunning to me. And so we have these seven diseases where they're essentially cured. There, there's no more disease in those children uh, or, or those patients. Um, or there's very minor residual stuff, five really helpful therapies that, you know, are, have made a dramatic difference in people's lives. And like if you saw my email on the ALS story where they tested it in worms, a, a big drug library, they found eight drugs that worked on an ALS mutation in worms, and then they used those eight drugs on patient cells, and they found two of them also worked to fix the patient cells. So that's, that's not a therapy because it's just in the lab, but it's a potential therapy that works in worms and patient cells. So it's, it's a pretty good lead, I would say. And we have 17 of those, 17 different diseases. So all of these are different diseases. New genes found, um, helpful tools developed. Um, and those, the helpful tools I, I found to be one of the coolest categories because it could be an educational booklet so an educational booklet translated into 20 languages is going to help people in 160 countries for a specific disorder. I mean, for $3,500 or $5,000, are you kidding me? Uh, it's phenomenal. And some of them are surgical tools to help surgeons do better. One was a 3D printing so that they could take a complex uh, throat surgery and do a 3D print of it and then practice their surgical approach so that they could do a safer surgery for the patient because you never know what you're going to do deal with when you get in and so they they had this idea to print 3d and and it and it worked another one was a spinal fluid collection device the correct collection from 20 percent success rate to 80 percent and better ways to assess patient uh, assess patients so a lot of really cool really interesting really neat stuff um, and a lot of our data comes from uh, a survey that we put out that uh, Dr. Shirin Kalyan and Lana Hoy developed for us when Shirin was our chief scientific officer. And we asked how, well, one of the things we know is that when we get, um, when we give out a microgrant, it's a very small amount of money, but it's to pursue an idea and people jump behind ideas. People love ideas. And, uh, and so the average number of researchers we get volunteering their time is, is 1.3, uh, 3.3 medical people, uh, almost one allied health practitioner, you know, physio, OT, those kind of people, um, graduate students, um, other people get involved, and lots of patients get involved and get behind these microgrants. Um, because there's, um, they're providing hope at the end of the day. They're, they're hope for the people with that condition, and they're also hope for everybody that your, your condition is one idea away, one interesting idea. And, and we have a big tent philosophy. So if grandma notices something and she said, you know, my grandson only gets a stroke when it's hot out. Can you look at that? And we've pursued that. Neil pursued that in his lab. And uh, uncovered the mechanism of disease that way because grandma's wisdom was incorporated into the research pipeline. And that's, that's the beauty of what we do with our big tent philosophy, that it, anybody, the, your physiotherapist, um, Deborah writing a book as a bibliotherapy, any therapy, any way we can help the rare disease community, we're, we're up for that.
a lot of research is done and not put out there. And so Cameron was talking about us putting our lay summaries on our website and we do that so that we're transparent so that you can see what goes ahead, what doesn't go ahead. Um, our, our, um, our total number of research publications are 550. These are actually peer reviewed papers coming out of this program. So really, this data is getting generated and shared. People are really, they like it. It's an 8.6 approval rating. It, they want more money. That's why it's not a nine or a 10, but uh, you know, can't please all of the people. So we, we learned that small is beautiful and it really doesn't take $2 billion to cure a disease. And that's important in this world. We also learned with all the helpful tools and all the way we improved care, there's a lot of ways to improve care. And our publications came anywhere from one to eight years later. So research is hard, but only 14% 14 and a half percent were negative studies, which means the people putting forward these ideas are particularly astute people. And we're pretty good at separating the wheat from the chafe. And so we can, we are, we are getting high value, high margin, high impact ideas out with our crowdsourcing model. And, uh, and so even though it's hard, we don't have a high failure rate as much of research does. And so we want to, We've done this $2 million pilot, 10 years, $2 million experiment. It's been stunningly successful and we want to go up to around 5 million and do this again um, to show that it's reproducible because in science you have to reproduce experiments or they're not valid. Um, so we want to increase the funding levels, make it more often. Um, we, we do fund Europe, um, North America, and Africa. We've uh, put about seven microgrants into Africa, and most of them have been successful. And so it's, it's really cool to, to know that rare is everywhere, and we need to fund it everywhere. And again, promote it to younger researchers and change hearts and minds.